Leipzig University. And um, academically, I work on um, leftist French Jewish intellectuals in the post war period, but um, the topic of my talk today will be about the anti Semitic anti Zionism within the left party, the Partei Die Linke, which is the left um, in English. And this is more out of a political interest. I'm a kind of political activist. I still consider myself a leftist. And I argue that um, I'm pro Israel and anti anti Semitic because I'm a leftist. And that's a pretty marginal position um, within the left, as you can imagine. And um, I also try to, what Nova Gold pointed out, as being an activist in the feminist movement and criticizing the feminist movement from within. That's what I was trying to do in the last years within the left movement, which is a very hard and not very encouraging um, job. Um, but first of all, let me uh, thank the organizers for inviting me and giving me the chance um, to speak at this outstanding, intellectually inspiring um, conference. Um, the left party, or I want to discuss the reasons uh, for the fierce hatred of Israel within the party, which, as I will argue, are twofold. One source can be discovered in the history of the communist GDR, and uh, the other one in the history of the Western German New Left. I will argue that the left is of special interest because it has developed specific for a specific form of anti-Semitic anti-Zionism that has become significant in other segments of society today. Um, concerning the hatred against Israel, uh, the left sometimes seems to be the trendsetter for the whole society. I will point this out uh, later um, concerning a parliamentary decision um, by the German Bundestag. Um, the an analysis of the left thus deserves more than the marginal attention. But let me start to, start to talk a little bit about, about the left party because it's probably not very much known um, in the US. The left party plays an increasingly bigger role in the German <coughs> political spectrum. It was founded in 2007 as a fusion of two other parties. So there are um, were parties before it, but um, one of the parties being um, the former Eastern German Communist Party, the SED. And today, the left party is a conglomeration of different currents, ranging from orthodox Stalinists to moderate reformers. But one thing is certain, the party has become an influential player in German politics, and it has a strong influence on the European left in general. Just to give some numbers and, and make it clear, uh, the party gained 12% in the last national election in 2009. So it's the fourth biggest party in the German national parliament, the Bundestag. Um, it also has several members in the European parliament and it's the most important player um, concerning parties in the uh, European left. It is represented in 13 out of 16 federal parliaments and it's part of a governing coalition in two federal states, one being the capital Berlin. So the left party is part of the governing coalition um, in Berlin. In the elections in the last two years, um, the party has grown up up to 28% in the Eastern German state, states, which is the former GDR, and up to 20% in the Western states. These were just some numbers to make uh, the relevance clear of the left party um, within the German um, political spectrum. Um, as I mentioned, I consider myself part of an unorthodox left, and um, I was a founding member of a group called Bak Shalom, which is working group um, Shalom within the left party. We try to criticize anti-Semitism, anti-Zionism, anti-Americanism um, within the party. And for some time, we got a lot of media attention. We forced people to deal with our position because the position were formulated from within. They were articulated within the party, so they couldn't be dismissed as some kind of lunatic pro-Israel leftist position. People had to deal with us, and they were really annoyed by it. And I, I gave many talks on these topics. I was yelled at to be a Zionist traitor, neocon warmongering, uh, right-wing lunatic, whatever. All the things uh, Nova Gold pointed out as well. Um, but we really managed to get the media attention, and for some time I was carefully optimistic that it might be possible to influence a party discourse. But um, this has failed, unfortunately, for the time being. 
and the orthodox leftist position that is anti-imperialist, strongly anti-Israel, and partially anti-Semitic has regained the absolute predominance um, in the party. And the latest example is an incident during the Gaza Freedom Flotilla. And um, this happened after I um, sent my um, uh, paper to this conference or applied, and then the incident I will point out shortly during the Gaza Freedom Flotilla happened because two current and one former member of the German Bundestag were on board of the Mavi Marmara, the ship that was boarded um, by the IDF, and all belonged to the left party. So three German parliamentarians were on board of the ship. Um, Norman Pech is a former uh, law professor at the University of Hamburg and former member of the German parliament. Annette Groth and Inge Höger, two union activists. They were shortly arrested um, when the ship was stormed, but soon released. The question is what happened when they came back to Germany? Were they criticized for co cooperating with fascist organizations? Did they have to justify themselves for supporting radical Islamists who are re reactionary to the core, who don't care about human ri rights at all, not to mention women rights? No, not at all. They didn't have to just justify anything. On the contrary, the leadership of the party said that it was proud of their mission. Um, and the only audible voice from within the party criticizing her colleagues, Petra Pausch, is the vice president of the German parliament. She now faces a storm of criticism from within the party herself. <coughs> the three passengers of the Mavi Marmara call themselves now survivors of the Israeli massacre. Uh, they started a propaganda tour in different uh, German cities uh, to talk about the heroic story. And there was one discussion event um, in Hamburg when Norman Pech, the former member of parliament and former professor, um, when he said that the next Garden Freedom Flotilla, which is already organized, and the youth group of the left party organizes and, uh, for the Gaza Freedom Flotilla, the next one, and Norman Page suggested that the next Gaza Freedom Flotilla should be accompanied by German maritime forces that control the Lebanese border. That demand would de facto, de facto amount to using German military against Israel. And I mean this is said by a former member of the German parliament, so um, I think that's a pretty scandal. Um, statements like this are really <coughs> the climax of a longer development. In 2006, another parliamentarian of the left party wanted to invite members of Hamas to a conference in Germany. Um, they couldn't enter because they were denied entrance visas to Germany. Many in the left party see Hamas as a legitimate, democratically elected government. They don't care at all about the ideological foundation and they ignore the virulent anti-Semitism. Another example, during the war in Lebanon in 2006, Christine Buchholz, today a member of the Bundestag, called Israel and the US warmongering nations, and she continued, I quote, it's a German quote, but uh, it's my translation, quote, on the other side of the conflict stand Hezbollah, the peace movement in Israel, and the international anti-war movement. End of, uh, that is the side on which I'm standing as well, end of quote. I mean, this is a leftist politician, a member of parliament, saying that she's on the side of Hezbollah. Um, that is, um, seems um, unbelievable, seems very strange, but I think it points to essential shifts um, in leftist ideology and politics. One key factor of the leftist hatred of Israel um, is anti-imperialism that is defined by the economist view of the world. This is a simplistic notion of complex modern societies and it often or basically always implies a personification of social relations. That leads to conspiracy theories and often Jews are seen as those pulling the strings behind the scene. Israel as a Jewish state is seen as a spearhead of Western imperialism in the Middle East and as an artificial state. Though they often don't talk about Israel, the Zionist entity, all the stuff you know, put it in quotation marks, all that stuff. The historical roots of the opinion in the left party are multi-layered. The first layer are the after effects of communist ideology and the politics in the GDR towards Israel. And the second layer is the result of the history of the new left movement in Germany starting in the 1960s. 
But let me come to the first one. The GDR was not an anti-Semitic state. Also, it had several anti-Zionist campaigns um, using anti-Semitic stereotypes. The GDR considered itself an anti-fascist state that had elim eliminated the root of fascism by nationalizing the big industry and expropriating the reactionary R Russian landowners, so-called Junkers, in Germany. The hegemonic notion of fascism in the GDR originated in the orthodox communist view expressed by Georgi Dimitrov in the mid-30s. And he said, fascism in power is, quote, the open terrorist dictatorship of the most reactionary, most chauvinistic, and most imperialistic elements of finance capital. End of quote. If fascism is seen primarily as a type of di a capitalistic dictatorship, anti-Semitism as an ideology has to be neglected. It was not seen as a core of Nazi ideology, but as a means of distraction by the ruling class to divide the proletariat. Auschwitz and the destruction of European Jews um, were not perceived as a rupture of civilization, as Dan Wiener, my PhD advisor, put it. Therefore, the Jews were not remembered as a distinct group of victims in the communist states in Eastern Europe. Um, the still existent anti-Semitism after 1945 in a big part of the German population was never dealt with in the GDR. Because according to the ideology of orthodox communism, the socialist nations were seen as the winners of history. So anti-Semitism was abolished because socialism was, had been established, etc. Um, besides the historical context of the Cold War, these ideological aspects play a major role in explaining the fears um, or ferocious um, veracity of anti-Zionism and the permanent comparison of Israel and Nazi Germany in the GDR. That is much more than a political critique, namely a fierce form of anti-Semitic anti-Zionism. And this hatred against Israel, deriving from the orthodox communist ideology, can be found until today in a large part of the left party. This is the first historical route. The other um, threat of um, anti-Israel resentment in the left party can be located in the history of the new left um, in West Germany. And the initial pro-Israel view of the majority of the left completely changed with the Six-Day War. Israel was not seen anymore as a socialist experiment with its kibbutzim and egalitarian ethos, but as a new oppressor state. It was seen as a racist and occupying power depriving the Palestinian of their human rights and their national homeland. The hostility towards Israel has to be understood in connection with the widespread romanticism of revolution in the 1960s. As the situation was not at all revolutionary in the Western democracies, and the proletariat that was supposed to be the revolutionary class proved to be com completely ignorant of its objective historical role, the longing for a revolution had to be transferred into the third world. The ideology of Germanisme, third world ideology, was on the rise, and the left began to support nearly all national liberation movements in the third world as kind of Ersatzhandlung, redirection activity, I think is the uh, English translation of the psychoanalytic term. First and foremost, the Palestinians were the objects of solidarity. They were seen as the oppressed underdog fighting against a powerful enemy. And the Palestinians served the leftist cult of the fighting guerrilla. Um, I have to, because I want to show a short film about an anti-Israel demonstration that was organized by Islamist groups, but many leftist members attended. So you get a, an impression of a very strong anti-Israel atmosphere uh, on these kind of demonstrations. But um, let me um, just make one other point. I wanted to talk about the specificity of uh, anti-Semitism in uh, the two Germanys after National Socialism, which is so-called secondary anti-Semitism. I can elaborate on this maybe later in the discussion. But what is a new development is um, a more and more open collaboration of parts of the left with uh, jihadist Islamist groups and movements. And um, this is, can be seen in the Gaza Freedom Flotilla. 
And uh, for example, the, the three parliamentarians asked why they um, attended the Gaza Freedom Flotilla, and what was the reason, and how they could cooperate with the Islamist and um, fascist uh, organization. They either denied that uh, these groups had taken part, or they denied the ideology. So they cannot really deal with the re reality on the ground. And I think one reason for the closer cooperation between Islamists and Orthodox leftists are um, that there's an overlap in ideology. There's a certain convergence in the ideology because both share an anti-imperialist worldview, the hatred of Israel and the US, and both share the desire for a simple pre-modernist world. Both reject globalization and financial capital. Both feel morally superior and they consider themselves to fight for a higher cause and to be always on the side of the oppressed masses. The leftist jihadist coalition can be observed on a global level as we have heard uh, yesterday in the alliance between Venezuela and Iran. And Venezuela and part of the uh, left movement in Germany is seen as the socialism of the 21st century, their um, solidarity um, groups with Venezuela and all that stuff. Um, to conclude, the left party cannot be dismissed as the irrelevant radical fringe, fringe of the German political spectrum. That would be too easy. Cases of anti-Semitic anti-Zionism can be found among politicians of all parties in Germany, but only in the left party members of the national parliament participate in the Gaza Freedom Flotilla um, and um, are supported by the party leadership afterwards. Um, concerning Israel and the conflict in the, in the Middle East, the left party sometimes seems to be the avant-garde in the society. That indicates another incident taking place shortly after the storming of the Mavi Marmara, when the German Secretary for Development, Dirk Niebel, a member of the Liberal Party, wanted to visit Gaza, but uh, he was denied entrance um, by the Israeli authorities. And afterwards, and this is for the first time, the German Bundestag, um, the National Parliament, unanimously, um, with no vote against it, um, had a statement against Israel, a resolution against Israel, condemning the blockade uh, in Gaza and condemning uh, Israel's behavior. This was for the first time. I think it was kind of a united front uh, of German parties um, against Israel. And this resolution, willingly or unwillingly, played into the hands of Hamas. And this is a new and alarming development. And the left party, even by conservative politicians who are supposed to be pro-Israel, was applauded for its position. Um, the discussion within the left party is far from over, but my prognosis is not very optimistic. Um, can I show some minutes from the film? Because it's a short film that was made by a friend of mine, Sebastian Meskes, who actually works in the National Parliament, and he's, uh, as myself, a member, founding member of the um, working group Shalom uh, within the left party. And um, it's a film about um, the demonstration in January um, 2009 in Berlin. And uh, during Operation Task Lead, there were Germany-wide many, many very big anti-Israel demonstrations uh, attending um, 10,000 of people and uh, all over Germany. And they were often organized by Islamist and leftist groups. And I will show you the film. We have some subtitles there in German. I think the people are shouting Tod, Tod, Israel, which is death, death to Israel. But uh, I will translate it during the film. And I hope you get... Um, impression that these demonstrations are not anti-war demonstrations demonstrating against a war that is considered to be unjust, but they are demonstrations of um, fierce hatred against Israel and the Jews. I hope you will get an impression. He said women, in the f women cannot be in the front. Uh, the demonstration was divided between men and women because it was organized by uh, that's in the center of Berlin. And uh, these are flags of the party Die Linke.
opens with the legs of the link man and in the background we hear other Palestinian flags all over the demonstration. He said they are filming us, they are photographing us, but we'll show them that we are civilized as well. Some minutes later, death death to Israel, helping uh, the whole demonstration. Um, child murder Israel is one of the slogans. The flag of the fascist Grey Wolf, uh, the Turkish organization next to a flag um, of the terror organization Hezbollah. And the left party has mobilized and uh, organized um, this demonstration together with other groups. They shout in child murder Israel. Yes, 
process is wrong. And uh, that's why we had to take the film off the web and got a lot of trouble because we pointed out, namely, uh, candidates of the left party in Berlin who participated in this demonstration. And he wanted to become a member of parliament um, in Berlin. So he was embarrassed by this? Yeah, pretty embarrassed. So how could he make you take it off? Um, the problem is that some members of uh, Bak Shalom, they actually work in the left party or work in the parliament. So they have a lot of... And I'm working on my PhD in Stuttgart in Germany as well. And in my dissertation, I am investigating how German, West German foreign policy towards the Middle East dealt with the issue of anti-Semitism and hostility towards Israel in the Arab world between 1952 and 1979. I am focusing on German-Egyptian relations, and my research also touches on the issue of the German political elites' relationship with their Nazi past. In this presentation, I want to focus on two things. Firstly, to the problem that German foreign policy sent signals to the Arab world that were understood as a support for Arab hostility towards Israel. And secondly, on the question, if there was a transfer of ideas from the Nazi time to the post-war period, for example, in the perception of Zionism, and how decisions um, that helped um, how decisions that helped to legitimize the Jewish state were connected to this Nazi heritage. And I'm mainly referring here to Germany's decision to refuse to establish diplomatic relations with Israel until 1965. Critical for my topic is that after 1948, a new anti-Semitism emerged that was directed um, against the very existence of a Jewish state. To be clear, Arab hostility towards Israel is not, not necessarily anti-Semitic. However, there is a line that is crossed where political enmity opposing Zionism becomes anti-Semitic. This line is crossed, for example, when there is a positive reference to Nazi anti-Semitism or when the acceptance and dissemination of conspiracy theories like the Protocols of the Elders of Zion ensues. The denial of the Shoah is also an important pillar of this new anti-Semitism. Since 1948, every country that was diplomatically involved in the Middle East conflict was confronted with Arab hostility towards Israel and therefore challenged with the task of reacting to such animosity. Herewith, an important question within my research arises. How did German diplomats react to Arab animosity towards Israel? Did Arab anti-Semitism play a role in the conceptions of German foreign policy? And if so, was this topic actually brought up with Arab states? Did, did diplomats do anything to confront this problem? While these questions emerged for all diplomats, for German diplomats, more specific concerns had to be addressed. Especially in Egypt, um, they were confronted with the repercussions of German anti-Semitic propaganda and politics, which many of them had personally designed and represented only a few years earlier. The Middle Eastern policy of the Nazis had been anti-British in design and anti-Semitic in its essence. Especially in the second half of, the world, of world War II, Germany had employed considerable efforts to incite Arabs to fight against Germany's enemies via radio propaganda with a distinctly anti-Semitic, anti-British, and anti-American makeup, as Jeffrey Herf convincingly describes in his illuminating new book. The Mufti of Jerusalem, Hajj Amin al Husseini, was a close ally of the Nazis. He had played a major role in programming propaganda broadcasts into the Arab world. In the post-war years, the Mufti, although he had been involved in war crimes, was a figure of considerable political influence in Egypt, and its Nazi-like anti-Semitism first and foremost affected the national movement of the Palestinians and the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt. Then there was also the circle of young officers, including Abdel uh, Nasser and Anwar as sadat In July 1952, they took over Egypt through a military coup d'etat. During World War II, both of them had collaborated with the Germans as guerrilla fighters. 
Both politicians, Nasser and Sadat, later recommended the Protocols of the Elders of Science to be an important source and valuable reading. Nasser's brother, uh, Sauki Abdel Nasser, personally edited, edited a new Arabic translation of the Protocols. And under Nasser's presidency in the 1950s, one of the most radical anti-Semitic publicists of the Third Reich, Johann von Leers, who was an open advocate of genocide, was employed in the Egyptian propaganda ministry. Von Leers was in charge with propaganda against Israel and organized lectures for Egyptian officials. Bernard Lewis is one of the historians who has pointed out how German National Socialism was openly praised in post-war Egypt, and this was the political climate that German diplomats faced in the country in the beginning of the 1950s. Usually, the historiography of German-Arab relations begins in 1952. In the end of this year, Günther Pavelke, the first West German ambassador, in, arrived in Cairo. But Günther Pavelke's arrival in Cairo was not the first chapter of German-Egyptian relations after World War II. Another group of Germans came two years earlier, and the leading person of this group was Dr. Wilhelm Voss, a former high-ranking SS officer. Voss had been one of Nazi Germany's leading managers. Since 1934, he held the position of a general manager for the Reichswerke Hermann Göring, and during World War II, he had a big armament conglomerates, mainly in Czechoslovakia, which was then occupied by Germany. Czech companies and trusts were bought or dispossessed and integrated into Nazi conglomerates, two of which were led by Voss. Voss was also a member of the so-called Circle of Friends of Heinrich Himmler, a group of 40 leading SS officers, Nazis and German industrialists, who advised the Nazi party in economic matters and supported the party financially. Thus, Voss really belonged to Nazi elite circles. He arrived in Egypt at the end of 1950, after having been in an American detention camp in Germany for about five years. He was situated in the Ministry of War. As an expert for the weapons industry, he laid down the foundation for an Egyptian weapons industry. He also brought several former generals and officers of the German armed forces to Egypt. These advisors served from 1951 to 1958 in Egypt, and the group was comprised of up to 60 German officers. Wilhelm Farnbacher, a former general, headed this subgroup that was located in the Egyptian army. Farnbacher's office was next to the office of the Egyptian chief of staff and they worked closely together. Although the advisor stressed that their job was merely one of consultation and that they did not hold command positions, they were clearly involved in military preparations for a war with Israel. Beyond documents on consultation and operative and strategic and tactical questions, I also found plans for military operations against Israel and Farnbacher's papers. The group came to Egypt when King Farouk was still in power. However, Farnbacher obviously also helped the three officers, the circle around Nasser and Najib, uh, with their coup against the king in July 1952. According to CIA sources, he prepared a plan for the army's internal control in Cairo in case that there would be a revolution after Najib had asked him for such a plan. Foss accompanies, Egypt, accompanied Egyptian officials on their trip to Germany and served as an intermediate to German industrial circles. He also held contacts to West German officials in the foreign office and the trade ministry and the chancellery. According to CIA sources, Foss was even received by Chancellor Adenauer in Germany. Many observers assessed his influence in Cairo and in Germany to be higher than that of Germany's official ambassador Pavelke, and rumors spread around in intelligence circles that Foss soon would become an official West German representative. <coughs> the position of Günther Pavelke, the first official German ambassador to Egypt, was therefore not easy when he arrived in, uh, later. The foreign ministry expected him to cooperate with Foss, and while the two Germans, the official and the unofficial ambassador in Egypt, in the beginning got along well, conflicts between the two emerged in April 1953, when Pavelke was concerned that Foss was acting against um, federal German interests. One claim was that he was cooperating with communists, another that he held close contacts to Arab and German circles, 
who tried to lead a campaign against the German compensation payments to Israel. Pavelke then refused to cooperate with Voss and ultimately decided to resign. He left Egypt in 1954. But Voss influence also faded, particularly after British Prime Minister Churchill in May 1953 in the House of Lords publicly criticized the activities of the German military advisors and accused them to train Egyptian guerrilla troops which attacked British, attacked British troops stationed in the Suez Canal zone. The German government then sent an official to Cairo who met with the advisors and gave them stricter guidelines. The group was separated in two units and obviously lost a great deal of its influence with the Egyptian government around 1954. In utilizing these contexts, the German government, and I believe, sent a political signal to Egypt signaling that former SS men were accepted mediators and negotiators, notwithstanding the fact that their function was to assist Egypt in its war against Israel, and notwithstanding the fact that these mediators were opposed to a rapprochement with Israel, which was the official German um, policy. I come to my second point, the question of a transfer of ideas inside Germany. In, inside the for, Foreign Office in West Germany, NS, open NS-like anti-Semitism was to do. Germany's main aim was to be integrated in the Western alliance economically and strategically. It was crucial to establish a new image of a democratic society and to demonstrate a new beginning. As the US High Commissioner John McCloy observed, Adenauer understood that the, that the way Germany acts towards Jews in the future will be the acid, acid test of German democracy. Adenauer in, 19, in September 1951 publicly announced that Germany was ready to pay compensation payments to Israel. But many of Adenauer's diplomats who held leading positions in the Foreign Office since the early 1950s had also held important positions in the Foreign Office during the Nazi regime. These civil servants had contributed to the Nazi policy that was based on anti-Semitism and hostility towards the West and made considerable efforts to spread this anti-Semitism in the Arab world to mobilize resistance against the British. I want to illust illustrate the transfer of ideas from the Nazi period to post-war political conceptions and how these ideas affected politics and focusing on the case of one diplomat as an example. Wilhelm Melchers had been employed in the Foreign Office since 19 1925. He had served in the Near East Department since 1931. He was director of this department since December 1939 and held this position until the end of the war. Jeffrey Herf describes in his book how he was involved in the anti-Semitic propaganda for the Arab world. After the war, from 1951 to 1953, Melchers was once again head of the Near East Department. Thus, he wielded considerable influence on Germany's policy towards the Near East and the re-establishment um, of German, West German relations to Arab countries. From 1953 until 1957, Melchers was the head of the German embassy in Baghdad. During this time, he was also in charge of the legation in Jordan and for reports on Israel. And his assistant used to be the former head of the uh, radio department who was really, who was um, inventing all this anti-Semitic propaganda towards the Arab world. How the anti-Semitic conception of Zionism influenced Melchers' assessment of the Near East conflict after the war becomes obvious in some of his reports. Let me quote from one example. In 1955, he sent a report from Baghdad analyzing Israel's policy. He described the Jewish state to be of an expansionist nature. Israel in its present form would establish a bridgehead providing the basis for future generous expansion. An uncompromising attitude on the Arab side would therefore be understandable, and a peaceful solution of the conflict impossible. The Arabs would feel only safe after the last Jew had left Palestine. This is what he wrote in his report in 1955. This report reveals how deeply Melchior's thoughts were still influenced by Nazi conceptions. The idea that the Jews were intending to combine Palestine with Syria and trans Transjordan in a huge Jewish home and to annihilate the Arabs entirely had been a core idea 
of the Nazi propaganda. Malthus' conclusion that it was impossible for Arab countries to tolerate even a small Jewish minority on Palestinian soil revealed his anti-Jewish worldview. In which way did this worldview affect West Germany's foreign policy? One of the most controversial issues in German Middle East policy was the question whether Germany should establish diplomatic relations with Israel. There's no time to explore this debate in detail, so let me only short, shortly mention the result. Uh, Germany refused to establish diplomatic ties with Israel until 1965. And it's typical for the German context um, as well that politicians did not openly announce this quality, but in, uh, in negotiations with Israeli intermediators, German politicians instead stressed that they were willing to establish relations, but at a later date. The decision for this policy was made in 1956, when a secret conference of German ambassadors who present, represented Germany in Middle Eastern states took place in Istanbul. The attending German ambassadors unanimously opposed the establishment um, of diplomatic relations to Israel, fearing protests from Arab countries, and as a consequence, Arab diplomatic recognition of the socialist um, part of Germany, the German Democratic Republic. They even voted against establishing a trade mission, which was then cancelled despite all prior promises. Wilhelm Eichers was one of the most outspoken advocates in this debate. His reasons are expressed in a letter that he sent to the head office in July 1955 from Baghdad. In this letter, he painted a grim picture should Germany establish diplomatic relations with Israel. He wrote, the establishment of diplomatic relations with Israel would cause a storm of outrage in Arab countries and would inflict serious damage to our political, economic, and cultural interests. It would definitely unsettle the German-Arab friendship and <coughs> due to the Arab mentality would turn friendship into hate because the Arab countries would not forgive the betrayal of a good friend. Um, Melchior's pointed to a crucial point, um, to a crucial other point, um, when, he, when, he, when he stressed that, um, yes, that the Arab states uh, thought that Germany <coughs> had acted under pressure when they signed the Luxembourg Treaty. Arab diplomats were convinced that the Germans were forced by the Americans to sign the treaty that um, organized, uh, that um, dealt with the compensation payment payments to Israel. This treaty um, regular, uh, sorry. Now, after Germany regained its sovereignty in 1955, the Arab world would expect that German, the German government refrained from any other step in favor of Israel. The idea that Germany was forced to sign the Luxembourg Treaty was indeed very widespread in the Arab world. Although this is not true, it is correct that the compensation payments were not very popular in Germany and among German politicians. And there are statements um, from Adenauer and others who stress that the payments were a necessity to regain credibility in the Western world in order to get credit and business contracts. The moral side of the question was rather stressed in retrospect. The Egyptian historian Vagi Atek quotes Egyptian sources revealing that Adenauer personally stated in front of an Arab delegation that the issue of reparations to Israel had been regulated in accordance with the wishes of the United States. Secretary of State Halstein reportedly said to the Egyptian Council General in Frankfurt, oh, under Secretary of State um, Halstein, reportedly said to the Egyptian Council General in Frankfurt, it is not possible not to sign the agreement. Israel, through the Jewish magnifying glass in America and England, is stronger than one assumes. It is impossible to the federal government to take counteraction. In those statements, the anti-Semitic stereotype of Jewish power was once again given new life. It is therefore not surprising that many Arab politicians and journalists had the impression that the Germans basically held anti-Semitic and anti-Israel views and the majority supported the Arab side in the conflict, in spite of the fact that Germany did not openly support the Arab side politically. Melchus knew that the Arab assumption that Germany um, was hostile to Israel and the Jews was an advantage for German foreign policy, and he did not hesitate to make use of this 
anti-Semitic component of the so-called German-Arab friendship. Many other German diplomats were also aware of the fact that they enjoyed considerable advantages in Arab countries compared to other Western states because of their refusal to have diplomatic relations with Israel. In the words of um, another legation counselor of the Foreign Office, and I quote, there has been a strong argument in favor of the Federal Republic, the fact that Germany has, in contrast to other Western democracies, no diplomatic relations with the State of Israel. If we lose this argument in the future, the only defensive weapon we possess will be beaten out of our hands. Voices like these dominated the debates in the Foreign Office of that time on this issue. And uh, with, this, yes, with these two episodes that I have described, so the, um, the first um, Germans in Egypt and the debate on um, the diplomatic relations to Israel, um, I think they both show how strongly anti-Semitism and complicity with Arab hostility towards Israel influenced the debates on foreign policy in the post-war years, and how political decisions that were taken added to the legitimization of Israel in that time. Okay. Thanks, Georg Mühlbach, and uh, I'm a sociologist and a member of this uh, Graduate School on uh, Group Focused Energy, which is a, a big project in Germany to uh, the research on uh, prejudice, not only anti-Semitism, but also racism, sexism, and so on. Um, well, the title of my uh, presentation may appear very vast and unspecific, but I will focus uh, it on uh, developments in more latent forms of anti-Semitism with an emphasis on metaphors of parasites and their use in contemporary Germany. Um, and also uh, by this about transfer of ideas from national social socialism to contemporary Germany. Um, yeah, uh, the presentation will be uh, structured as uh, follows. Uh, at first, I will give a, a brief empirical overview, showing uh, some pictures. Second, uh, some theoretical approaches uh, that may apply to this. And uh, third, uh, some <coughs> hypotheses about metaphors and latency of anti Semitism. Um, as you all uh, probably uh, know, National Socialism made uh, in their, or uh, in its uh, anti-Semite ideology and propaganda a very vast use of metaphors with which they dehumanized their victims. Metaphors of plague, of cancer, of octopuses, which encompasses the whole world with their tentacles, and of different sorts of insects and parasites. In the year 2005, Franz uh, Müntefering, a famous member of the German Social Democratic Party, who at that time was also the uh, Secretary of Labor, decried private equity funds as uh, locusts or as grasshoppers uh, who don't care about German workers and German industry, who are anonymous, who don't take any responsibility for uh, Germany and who in general swarm over Germany and exhaust its economy. Uh, since 2005 in Germany, the talk of parasites takes a firm place in a lot of public discourses, especially about the national, national economy, about hedge funds, and so on. I will give you some examples of this so that you can uh, see by yourself what I'm talking about. Well, this is uh, the first one. Uh, the first uh, three pictures are, in a certain sense, the most drastic ones concerning their allusions uh, to anti-Semitism. They are taken from uh, Metall, uh, a magazine of Germany's biggest uh, labor union, which decried uh, US financial investors um, yeah, from the year 2005. The second one is uh, this mosquito in a more detailed uh, illustration. The third one from uh, within uh, the magazine uh, showing those uh, mosquitoes swarming all over Germany. Uh, 
Uh, this one is taken uh, from uh, the cover of Germany's biggest uh, weekly magazine, uh, Der Spiegel, saying in its headline, the, the greed of uh, the, the big money or the greediness of, of the money. Uh, this one is taken uh, from a, a strike of members of the German labor union Verdi. It's also very graphic and uh, the banner uh, is uh, saying uh, against stock traders parasites or uh, stock traders vermin. And uh, on this uh, spray, uh, spray can uh, they, they write extra socially acceptable. And the last one uh, is taken from Berlin. Uh, uh, it is a leftist and anti-imperialist anti call for a demonstration on the occasion of 1st of May opposing uh, rising rental fees. And I think what uh, becomes very obvious is that all those illustrations uh, have something in common. Uh, not only do they uh, depict complex matters uh, of society in a very simplifying uh, manner by using those metaphors of parasites, uh, there are a lot of more components uh, by which they refer to anti-Semitic ideology. I will come to that later. Um, but, and uh, that is uh, important, there is one very striking difference uh, to national socialism. All of them don't openly blame the Jews uh, for the economic distortions they try to visualize. And that leads to the main question I'd like to tackle in this presentation. Are we confronted with a form of latent anti-Semitism? Is this form of depiction chosen due to the fact that in Germany, one is by law not allowed to uh, blame the Jews openly. Um, in order to tackle this, I'd like to outline some thoughts about latency, a concept that has been, and still is, very famous in uh, German research on anti-Semitism. Um, especially, but not only in Germany, we are confronted with aspects uh, of and changes in anti-Semitic hatred beyond the anti-Zionist one. In the country that is responsible for the systematic exter extermination of the Jew European Jews, contemporary research on anti-Semitism developed concepts that take into account that after 1945, it is no longer possible for anti-Semites to utter their stereotypes in an open uh, manner uh, uh, as far as uh, the public discourse is concerned as it was common in, uh, neo in uh, Nazi Germany. Werner Bergmann and Rainer Erb described that phenomenon as a form of communicative latency, pointing out that the social taboo trigger changes in the stereotype content. Research since then has dealt with the fact that anti-Semitism is not an invariant uh, stereotype, but adapts to concrete historical circumstances and could therefore be described as a flexible prejudice, which is a notion of theology Adorno. The current literature on anti-Semitism gives a lot of evidence to substantiate this assumption. If we grasp anti-Semitism as a stereotype that consists of a certain historically rather invariant form, which flexibly adapts to different contents relative to specific historical circumstances, we are able to more adequately conceptualize the, same, the changes we observe in a theoretically uh, sophisticated framework. The stereotypical form of anti-Semitism consists of certain elements that already have been described in some detail. Thomas Howry, uh, for example, distinguishes a Manichaean worldview, the personalization of complex matters, conspiracy theory, ethnification, and the goal of extermination. We can find these structural elements, for example, in anti-Zionist anti-Semitism and exemplification for the assumption that the form is getting a new content and adapts to new, e.g., uh, for example, uh, geopolitical uh, circumstances. Concerning the contemporary economic and financial crisis, the formal uh, regard may indicate that the potential for a widespread, renewed, manifest anti-Semitism as a 
world conspiracy theory is possibly much larger than the focus on the mere content is able to reveal. In the case of Germany, results from an empirical study uh, show, an, uh, show a large amount of people who attribute the cause uh, of the crisis to the bankers and the stock traders um, uh, and the alarming uh, additional uh, find, finding is that this causal attribution is significantly correlated with overt anti-Semitism. Uh, theoretically, this phenomenon could be grasped as a prejudiced, uh, false reaction on the development of capitalism and capitalist modernity. Moishe Poston uh, links this false reaction to the general constitution of capitalist societies. According to Poston, people tend to attack only the abstract and so-called unproductive uh, elements of capital, e.g., uh, for example, uh, financial capital, and uh, to personalize them in the alleged evil character of the Jew, while uncritically glorifying the so-called productive capital, for example, industry or agriculture. Um, according to him, people tend to personalize what they perceive as threatening developments of modern society. In this regard, the development from a religious anti-Judaism to modern anti-Semitism can be seen as closely associated in, uh, to the crisis-led development of modern capitalist societies. Um, as for Germany, we are on the one end able to prove by quantitative data that the hatred against the state of Israel is one of the dominant aspects of anti-Semitism today. On the other hand, the noted perceptions of the ongoing financial and economic crisis and the uh, frequent causal attribution to bankers and stock traders point towards the possibility that uh, there may be a large group of people who, although not openly blaming the Jews uh, for the economic distortions, show patterns of thought that may be transformed into a renewed image of a Jewish world conspiracy. The widespread talk of a real and honest and productive economy that is opposed to a parasitic and uh, greedy financial economy that is said to be controlled by uh, the Jews is, as we know by Costone and others, one of the elements of anti-Semitism. What we see today in Germany uh, are worldviews that contain those elements without directly linking them to the Jews, uh, as we have uh, seen in, in those illustrations. They make use of the form of anti-Semite worldviews without giving it a mani manifest anti-Semitic content. Thus, we have a stereotypical critique of the modern society that consists, consists partly or fully of formal elements that could easily be found in manifest anti-Semitism, but are not yet linked to it. Nonetheless, a critical and cautious research on anti-Semitism has to suspect that this connection could easily be established either by right-wing movements, agitators or politicians in everyday discourse. This implies that a certain stereotyped critique has to be affiliated with an image of the Jew or a Jewish world conspiracy. Okay. After uh, this short excursion, a theoretical excursion uh, on latent anti-Semitism, I will come uh, back to the problem of uh, metaphys and try a short summary of uh, both latency and metaphys. Um, the first one, metaphors, uh, as we've seen in those illustrations, are necessarily ambiguous. Uh, they convey a content that may be interpreted in many different directions. And in this sense, uh, they may be the basis for a cross-party uh, consensus, like uh, the notion locust or grasshopper already uh, seems to be partly in, in Germany, because uh, uh, this metaphor is used from uh, from right wing activists uh, to the to the left and uh, the the middle of of the political spectrum. 
by using that term, right-wing uh, extremists really uh, mean the Jews without having to say the Jews in their propaganda. While no globals, for example, may only mean hedge funds when they say locusts or grasshoppers. Nonetheless, um, in uh, my uh, examples, they convey a certain view on uh, society. For example, they personalize uh, abstract social mechanisms. They are Manichaean, that the evil comes from outside and Germany uh, is depicted as self-consistent and as a victim. Uh, they differentiate between a good, productive, and a bad, greedy, unproductive, unpro parasitic uh, economy, which uh, has been and is, of course, an element of anti-Semitism. And or but there is uh, no manifest, uh, no manifest ethnification uh, to to the Jews, or at least not yet a manifest ethnification. <coughs> Um, and thus, uh, they contain, uh, this is uh, the fourth point on the sheet, uh, they contain some or all formal elements of anti-Semitism without openly blaming the Jews. And additionally, they constitute a very widespread ideological form of either worldviews that are latently anti-Semitic or at least easily adaptable to anti-Semitism. Um, and of course, uh, this or this or this, these metaphors may pass on world views that may easily be transformed into uh, manifest uh, anti-Semitism. Uh, they may be uh, or they may serve as a transfer of ideas from uh, national socialists or from Nazi uh, regime uh, in, uh, to, uh, towards con contemporary Germany. Um, well, and uh, an additional point uh, that I didn't list on, on this sheet, um, people who use this metaphors to describe society act, and that is uh, a word or a sentence that uh, Hanno Löwy once wrote, as if there are no real Jews anymore who could feel threatened by that, um, or as if the Holocaust had never happened, where uh, metaphors like these um, we are the rehearsal for destruction. Thank you. My name is Karin Stöbner. I am um, from Vienna and I'm working at the Vienna University as a sociological department and at the Central European University in Budapest. Uh, in my paper today, I would like to address some theoretical uh, considerations on nationalism and anti-Semitism in post-national Europe. Um, thereby, I would like to refer uh, primarily on uh, Jürgen Habermas, Adorno and Horkheimer. So in the late uh, 20th century, several resurrections of open and aggressive nationalism could be observed in uh, um, in Europe, in Germany, for example, in the course of national unification in Austria during the debates on the Waldheim affair, and also in Eastern and, South and Southeastern Europe, where nationalism occurred as a, one could say, concomitant of the breakdown of the Soviet system. Um, and it's interesting to know that almost in simultaneously um, in Europe, uh, a discourse on the post-national was initiated and this was primarily by Jürgen Habermas. And the question uh, which I would like to address here is uh, what is becoming of nationalism in the era of post-national uh, orientation, or of allegedly post-national orientation? And uh, the corresponding question is whether the post-national constellation uh, will also diminish nationalist and anti-Semitic prejudice, a pair of prejudices which is traditionally associated with each other. Um, in Habermas' concept, uh, the term uh, of the post-national constellation is very closely connected to the term of constitutional patriotism. And Habermas introduced this term um, as a critical one and as a uh, cosmopolitical alternative to nationalism. Uh, constitutional patriotism means a dissolution of the traditional 
very close link of republicanism and nationalism. And um, it means that uh, people's republican disposition, which Habermas uh, suggests as normative, that this uh, republican disposition would be transformed into a constitutional patriotism beyond such categories like tradition and nation. Um, the need of belonging uh, would be fulfilled by identifying with universal values rather than uh, with, um, uh, with the country of origin. So the love of one's nation would be based on the love of freedom and uh, of human rights that nation stands for and, not, um, and no longer, would no longer recur on essentialized and ethnicized moments. Hamas' concept of constitutional patriotism and thus also of the post-national constellation uh, is very much based on the German historical background. So, uh, according to him, after the Shoah, national identification in Germany and Austria was problematic, if not impossible. The breakdown of the Nazi regime and the shock of the Holocaust would have caused a rupture within the narrative of the historical national continuity in Germany and also in Austria. After this, an unbroken national identity would not be possible anymore. Habermas addressed this in the course of the historical Streit, uh, the debates on nationalism and revisionism concerning the public exposure to the Nazi past which was carried out in the 1980s in the public German media. And this very debate, this debate on historical Streit, where there was really open nationalism and open anti-Semitism, this very debate shows that um, Habermas' normative concept of constitutional patriotism is not at all the norm in Germany. And um, it is rather an idea with which reality corresponds only in a few exceptions. And in this presentation, I would like to highlight that the rupture in the historical narrative um, the Shoah has, has brought about, um, uh, that this rupture was successfully covered and uh, now a national us was created, recreated, and it was especially the Shoah uh, which served as basis for recreation of a new national us. Um, the relationship between uh, nationalism and the post-national is not really well defined in Habermas' concept. So um, it is important to note that constitutional patriotism does not, um, does not replace national identification, not at all. But um, it has to be understood that Habermas uh, in a certain way tries to give the Germans back the possibility of national identification. So to say that um, uh, constitutional patriotism would represent a um, reconciled notion of national identification. So we have to think of a, a national feeling ripped of pathological nationalism and a national feeling founded on a form of civic solidarity and on citizenship. According to Adorno, however, uh, the dynamic between a supposedly sound national feeling and an excessive one cannot be stopped. And the reason for this is that uh, the untruthfulness of the national feeling as such is founded in the very identification of a person with a nation or group in which they find themselves by hazard. So it is all a question of identification, a question of exclusionary uh, forms of identification. And also contemporary scholars like Lotus Brubaker point to uh, the exclusionary force not only of ethnic nationalism, but also of its civic variant. For Habermas, nationalism is a modern phenomenon of cultural integration. And as I said already today, nationalism would no longer be, could no longer be, the basis of collective identity. 
formation, especially in the Western societies. Robert Fine addressed this point yesterday in his lecture uh, with regard to anti-Semitism. That anti-Semitism would be regarded as a problem of the past. And obviously, this is the same uh, with nationalism in these debates on post-national constellations. So from this perspective, nationalism appears as an anachronism, as an irrational and antiquated tradition. And this uh, implies, uh, implies also that the undoubted persistence of nationalism, because nobody would doubt that, this uh, persistence of nationalism is more or less laid into the responsibility of the individuals who uh, don't act as modern as the social circumstances would require. So we, uh, we get the impression that uh, nationalism would be an individual blunder rather than founded in today's social structures. But I have the impression that uh, it's not so much nationalist identification which is an individual problem, but much more post-national one seems an individual matter as it is not really common today. Um, as with secondary anti-Semitism, also nationalism persists not only in spite of the Shoah and of National Socialism, but also because of it. Um, nationalism is still a means to establish continuity to uh, cover up the breaks of civilization, the very break of civilization the Shoah has brought about. Horkheimer's and Adorno's analysis of nationalism and anti-Semitism uh, goes in this uh, very direction, and it is based on the observations they made in the studies on the authoritarian personality, which they did in the 1940s here in America. And there they analyzed nationalism, anti-Semitism, ethnocentrism, and sexism as belonging to one single anti-democratic attitudinal syndrome. And in this broader ideological system, this phenomena are not only uh, interrelated, but they can also vouch for each other, and they can intensify each other. Thus, if like in Germany, after the breakdown of the national um, after the breakdown of National Socialism, of, Nazi, of the Nazi regime, anti-Semitism and open racist, racism were tabooed to a certain degree. But then, a functionally equivalent ideology uh, can come to the fore behind which anti-Semitism and racism still prevail. And in this uh, specificity, Horkheimer locates the topicality of nationalism after 1945 as, so to say, a catalyst of uh, anti-Semitism. The new idol, he writes, is the national we, or the national us. And this is why Horkheimer concentrated much more on the study of nationalism than on the study of anti-Semitism when he returned from US exile. He viewed nationalism as an expression of secondary anti-Semitism. So, so today, uh, the nation may undergo uh, specific changes in terms of function and structures, the basis of nationalism uh, still prevails in, prevails in uh, society. Uh, and one, uh, very, one major uh, moment of this uh, basis is the antagonist relationship of the individual and the collective. This is also, I, don't, I, I cannot go in, uh, into this uh, now because it's uh, because of time uh, reasons. This is all worked out in the authoritarian personality, which uh, uh, Adorno and Horkheimer research. Uh, what, is, um, what is important, uh, an important difference uh, between uh, or to the concept of Habermas is that Horkheimer and Adorno uh, put nationalism, see nationalism as, um, and the need for it, uh, that it is brought about by society and it's not an individual problem. So we have to understand both nationalism and anti-Semitism as structural categories central to contemporary capitalist society and not as mere prejudices, uh, which could be opposed by hinting to the fact that anti-Semitic representations do not correspond to reality but stem from universal delusion. So if, for example, in uh, the current debates on the financial and economic crisis, the responsibility for uh, the crisis and for 
globalization and so on is laid exclusively or is seen, or is seen exclusively uh, on the part of inter so-called international financial capital. Um, this um, also suggests that there is a, a certain favor for national productive uh, capital and uh, Björn also uh, mentioned this in, in his talk. And uh, with this, it, it doesn't suffice to say uh, or to mention that or to state that not all Jews are bankers and not all bankers are Jewish. So because this wouldn't uh, be a for, of any result with regard to um, this ideology because it's not just prejudice which can be, um, which can be um, well, put to the right. So let's come back, uh, we'll come to my conclusion, let's come back to uh, the question of how the post-national constellation that Habermas diagnosis affects nationalism and anti-Semitism. As far as I can see, post-nationalism is more or less a norm that is not fulfilled today. Of course, we all would, ha would like to have a post-national society, but it's not given. Identification still widely works by means of violent homogenization by means of orientation towards the strong and the powerful, and by exclusion of those considered as others. This is, I guess, the same in any society. And real post-nationalism would not just signify a status beyond nationalism, but also a status beyond anti-Semitism. Thus, Habermas' concept of the post-national constellation, although he, uh, he suggested as a given one in the European Union, is much more um, a, um, a utopia which we have to uh, fight for, in a way. He himself insists on the, on the necessity of post-national society and he does it rightly. Uh, now, the EU, uh, which for quite a number of scholars, including Habermas, uh, serves as a background of post-national identification, um, the EU actually reproduces the problem of national identification on a different level. Uh, the principle of nationalism, of nationalist exclusion, of national identification is relocated on the EU level. And um, as an outcome, the EU is a big block with which the people of the member states can as easily identify with as beforehand with uh, uh, the, with, a, with a single nation state, as long as it represents strength and power. What has changed, indeed, is the level where anti-Semitic prejudices are produced today in Europe. This is because this is no longer a purely national one, but happens more and more on a supranational, but only allegedly post-national level. This comes along with a considerable change in the anti-Semitic stereotypes. Uh, while in 19th century's political anti-Semitism, the Jew, to the figure of the Jew, was fed within the nation, was represented as an anti-national figure, as a threat to the national principle, as uh, where Jewishness was considered as, 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 as non-national. Uh, it seems that today this is not so much the case anymore, or not exclusively the case anymore. Um, since the inauguration of the Israeli nation state, and especially since 1967, anti-Semitic discourse, um, particularly those of the left, um, do not draw the figures of the Jew as, an, as, a, representative, as a representative of the anti-national anymore, but instead as a personification of the very principle of the national. I think this is quite interesting. Um, because this is the principle of the national which one allegedly has overcome oneself. And today, uh, the Jew is at least as often associated with aggressive nationalism as with cosmopolitanism. And these two, um, these two representations go into, into each other, they interconnect. New anti-Semitism, which uh, singles out the Jewish nation state as anachronistic, in an allegedly post-national era, operates with similar, if not the same, anti-Jewish stereotypes as uh, the nationalist variant. So in the disguise of anti-Zionism, 
nationalism as well as anti-Semitism can be acted out without arousing suspicion. Yet the agents of these single edge discourses can still represent themselves as anti-nationalist. But negatively, these discourses manifest a widespread need for national hold um, while allegedly standing up against nationalism in blaming others as anachronistically adhering to national principle. And I think we have to think of these interconnections when we talk about post-national constellations, about post-national identities, and the possibility to bring them about. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, I just wanted to make sure um, I got you right. You didn't show pictures in order to say they are anti-Semitic, but to say how easily they can be used for an anti-Semitic worldview, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I I wouldn't say this uh, this is anti-Semitic, but yeah. uh, my uh, my hypothesis uh, would be would be that um, first uh, they transport uh, elements of anti-Semitism into uh, today's thought from national socialism uh, in our time, um, and second, of course, they could e easily uh, be adapted by agitators, anti-Semit parties, and so on. This is the main point. I I, well, I, I think I would put it a bit more careful, exactly because yeah. th th there are a lot of trade unionists who actually see the uh, the animal figure, and they talk about managers. And even if you ask, uh, we'll find out there's you no. Know, they don't make a Jewish connection. And if you don't pull the Joker card and say, well, it's in the unconsciousness, then you actually have to admit that it, it's a wrong type of uh, criticizing modern society, but it's not anti-Semitic per se. Um, so I think it, it but he, I completely agree that it shows a lot of links between yeah. this kind of criticizing modern society and of an anti-Semitic critique. I would agree on the point that, uh, of course, uh, the people who, I don't know, have shown this fairness, if you ask them and, uh, and uh, well, ask, ask them about anti-Semitism, they would say, what, me? Uh, this, this has nothing to do with uh, anti-Semitism. Anti-Semite. Uh, so of course, uh, it uh, refers more to a kind of gray gray area of, of the research on anti-Semitism because, in general, there is uh, at least uh, well a, dif a very uh, a definition of anti-Semitism. And uh, if someone is not talking about the Jews, uh, then it uh, come, doesn't come into the focus of the research on anti-Semitism. But uh, I would uh, would like to try to focus on that too. So. Okay, and uh, the one to Karin. Um, I wondered about Habermas' uh, concept about the first uh, national constellation, since uh, I find it interesting. Actually, I don't know. Maybe you can explain to me better. Uh, he says this new, um, um, how do you call it, this uh, huh, huh, patriotism? Constitutional. Yeah, constitutional patriotism. Um, is about believing in human rights and some other political uh, 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 basic ideas, but for me that doesn't connect at all to nationalism or national identity. If you believe in certain political values, then you believe in a certain political project. Even if you would agree, well then, you know, let's get together for all those who believe in that political project, that doesn't make a nation, or vice versa, there's no nation in the world, uh, well, there has been one for a very short time in, in 1789 in France where people could actually sign the constitution and thereby sign up to the nation. But this is not the way uh, modern nation states work. So isn't that a contradiction in Habermas' argument? Well, maybe, yes, yes, I would, I would agree with that. But, um, um, so, but when Habermas talks about nationalism, he has in mind uh, in the first place, ethnic nationalism and the pathological nationalism of the Nazis. Of course, he has this German background and he's working in the first place uh, before the German background, but he puts his thesis uh, as relevant for the whole of Europe in the end. So, uh, and uh, when, I, when I said that he wanted to rescue uh, the possibility of national identification for uh, the Germans, uh, then uh, I mean that he, he doesn't really um, he doesn't really question the concept of national identification. For him, this is um, well the only well he he, he, he accepts the, the, the necessity of national identification today in this society, and he thinks that uh, 
if we don't uh, identify with, don't know, uh, ethnicized or, 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 or other, uh, well, biolo biologized uh, moments, but with uh, human rights or with, um, with constitution, then this would make a difference. And of course it makes a difference. It makes a big difference, a very big difference. But uh, it doesn't, uh, it, still, it still stays in the, in the area of, uh, of identification, of excluding others. So uh, even if it's not so uh, badly excluding the others, of course. <laughs> but well, this is, this is the point I wanted, to, I wanted to make. I've seen five hands so far, so I, you, Ursula, and then we, we make a round like this, yeah. so five hands. I have two questions to clear. Uh, one concerning Horkheimer and one concerning Habermas. Yeah. Uh, you might know that I was student with Horkheimer. And, uh, uh, that was uh, when I was young, we were demonstrating against the war in Vietnam, and Horkheimer, uh, whom we adored, he refused to side with us, and he said, uh, this is anti-Americanism, and we did not understand him. Well, now, today, I understand him better. The question is, uh, I discovered when I was two years ago working here at TSA, I discovered uh, a statement by uh, Horkheimer in which he uh, equates anti-Americanism with anti-Semitism. Where do you place this in your thinking? This is uh, the first question. And concerning Habermas, yeah, uh, uh, you know, post-national and Habermas also later on after 9/11, he, he coined another term, the post-secular society. In in, uh, in his uh, Glauben and Wissen, he argued that uh, we, we must go be uh, as as to go beyond the national, to go also beyond the secular, to understand the other. And for him, the other is uh, the world of Islam. And in my understanding, he did not understand that the return of the sacred, which he labeled as uh, was secular, was a, a return of a political totalitarian religion. I mean, not Islam, but Islamism. So uh, uh, can you relate post-national to post-secular? Because the idea of the nation, I mean, in France, you heard the first question, la nation, la nation, c'est la, la laïcité. Uh, not in a German case, in the French case. But to go beyond the national, it's also to go beyond the secular, and to, op to go beyond the secular is to embrace somebody who, who is not a friend of the Jews. Yeah. Mm -hmm. how, how do you place both? I mean, yes. first, a whole camera than Habermas. Yes, uh, I, uh, the first question is for me easier <laughs> to be answered, uh, because anti-Americanism is uh, really, especially in, in Germany and also in Austria, uh, I'm always, always speaking for Austria too, um, is a, a very important item, I would say because um, it is not so easy in, uh, for, for Austrian and German anti-Semites to uh, express their anti-Semitic uh, prejudice openly. So anti-Americanism has become a sort of um, voucher for anti-Semitism, so just as nationalism, for example. So um, um, I don't know whether this uh, answers the question uh, uh, now, how, where, where do you place this in your thinking? Yeah? Because you have a theoretical approach, yeah? and the focus was on the nation, and uh, uh, your, your perception of Horkheimer. Right? You did not mention anti-Americanism in your presentation. No, 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 but no, where I, do you place it in your thinking? Yeah? Uh, Anti-Americanism? Yeah, I mean, uh, Horkheimer equates, uh, this is mm -hmm. a, a quote was I discovered very late, he equates the wrong book. You can find it in the years lecture, which it's printed downstairs. Yeah? It's a, he equates anti-Americanism with anti-Semitism. The question is, how do you place this in your theory? Yeah? Yes, I would agree with that, uh, actually. Uh, but still, it is um, it is difficult to say what is actually anti-Americanism. So not any critique on the American on the U.S. politics is anti-American. I would say. So uh, it's uh, more or less the same question as with, as with uh, when becomes anti-Zionism anti-Semitic. So uh, not, any, uh, not any critique on the Israeli politics is uh, anti-Zionist in the sense of anti-Semitic. And I would say it's the same with uh, anti-American critique. Not any critique on Amer America is anti-American. Because, um, because uh, many scholars, and, and, and I, I guess uh, Adorno and Horkheimer were two of them. 
uh, they criticized America, but they also criticized America, but because they were in favor of what America stood for, of what America represented, of freedom, of, uh, uh, of actually for um, America stood after after 1945. America stood for the old um, ideals of the French Revolution. We only got 10 minutes left, and we have many people who want to uh, share their point of view. So I would, I would like to say something. But I, I would. To, to everyone, to the very short, short questions for the responses, if possible. I, I, I have, I have one question or one remark. I find it a little bit strange. I mean, Sebastian showed a film um, where we see 20,000 um, people in Berlin shouting uh, anti-Semitic slogans, to uh, still say. It's not so easy for Germans to openly <laughs> express anti-Semitism. I just think it's not true. And I think you see, um, I, I know what you mean, and I, th I, I, I understand, and I think this is true for a specific time. But after September 11, I think it's more and more, um, there's more and more open anti-Semitism, um, at least. And I mean, there's some debates like the Mollemann, uh, the Liberal Party made an public, pub, um, open anti-Semitic um, election campaign. And all this, so I just um, want to stress. I mean, we, we had it, we heard this several times this morning that it's not, I mean, there's no open, it's not easy to express open anti Semitism. I just think that it's in the last 10 years, this is not true anymore. So, don't you think? Yes, you're probably, uh, one, one, but you're probably right with, uh, with the demonstration. But when you look at the, at the uh, uh, at the media, for example, then there it is not it is not possible to express it. Too much. This is what this was what I meant, and then anti-American anti-American prejudice uh, stands for anti-Semitic prejudice. Very often. I think it would be necessary to discuss the phenomenon of Islamic anti-Semitism and the shifting demographics within German society. We have a whole generation of Turkish, German, Arab Germans who don't have the historical or the family background, the experience of National Socialism. And that changes. They don't have the restriction. Jew has become a curse word in many schools in Berlin. Um, and that's a problem. To uh, call someone a Jew or gay, these are like words that are used to denounce people. But this is by the Islamic. Um, Ursula? Yes, I would like to make uh, basically two comments to yours also and specifically to, and also to um, Ulrike's uh, presentation. Um, as a German who was born before World War II and was raised in Germany and then left in 65, uh, these presentations make my blood boil. Uh, I'm not Jewish and I, I still follow the uh, goings on in Germany, but of course not as a student because I don't live there, even though I've been there on lectures. But the specificity of the the, and the of the of the Jew hatred and the anti-Semitism and the support for uh, Islamists and Hamas and Hezbollah, Hosbe which is so blatant, really, really makes my blood boil. The other comment I would like to make: I'm often told by Germans, you know, the Nazi regime uh, lasted uh, 12 years. Uh, why is everybody, and with everybody, of course, it's code for the Jews, or the world, which is another code for Jews, are still talking about it. Well, from what I've heard yesterday and today, it started, we can actually look at 140 years where genocidal anti-Semitism has been expressed, practiced, to 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 uh, to an enormous with enormous success in quotes between 13 and 45, and it is alive and well in the 21st century. In the very back. Um, yeah, two questions. One, Ulrike, uh, it's not that I want to defend uh, the people you're describing in the 50s from being anti-Semitic, but um, to what extent do you think we could? attribute at least some of their willingness to entertain this, maybe not the key players, but the surrounding uh, public or the surrounding circle of, of players, um, I, I just out of fear, of, they're intimidated by the Arab nations, that they're really afraid. You don't have to be anti-Semitic to be afraid of Arabs getting pissed at you for siding with Israel in any way, shape, or form. Um, so that's one question that we'll make. And then the question on Habermas, 
I mean, listening to it, it's interesting. Does Habermas apply this principle of post-nationalism to Israel in the same way that, for example, uh, Tony Judd does? Because, you know, what you were describing, Tony Judd is sort of a, um, uh, an epigony of, uh, of, um, of Habermas. He's taken this post-nationalist discourse and said, oh, you know, the Jews are an anachronism in the 21st century where we're all post-nationalists, and the only problem is that we're in a neighborhood where everybody is pre, pre-modern, much less pre-post-nationalist. So um, does Habermas do this, or, and, and how does he respond to people who do do this? Uh, well, um Okay. <laughs> um, I mean, I describe, I chose here in my presentation the examples of <clears throat> one diplomat and I mean the advisors, the SS member. Right. Is, I mean, They're in question. Oh, yes. So, but this, these t- two important figures in the Foreign Office were really responsible for the Arab, uh, for the Nazi propaganda for the Arab world, and so <clears throat> they were in the core of the, I mean, of the Nazi propaganda machine. And they really, I I think um, that it's true that this had an enormous impact on the Arab world and an enormous impact of how policy, I I mean, how political decisions were made after the war. For example, the Mufti was one of the most um, assiduous supporters for a war against Israel in 1948. if you say after that, I'm now afraid of what I did, I mean, it's possible. I, I think this plays a role. I think uh, you can see, especially in the beginning of the 50s, that they were aware, um, uh, well aware of the fact that this anti-Semitism is a dynamic and strong factor, and that you have to you find many reports where they try to assess it, how strong it is, and they knew it's a, it's a weapon. It's a very dangerous weapon. So maybe they were afraid of that. That's possible. But I think this doesn't change uh, so much. And they, of course, were um, afraid of losing. Uh, I mean, they were ma- very concerned with um, um, that the Arab states or every third world country could recognize the socialist state. And so this was the main motive. This is what they said, to uh, prevent that um, the Arab states have more an, another argument to say we recognize uh, the socialist state because you are hostile to us. So, but I think this also doesn't change um, my assessment of this politi- these political decisions. Uh, well, um, Habermas, uh, um, Habermas uh, formulated here as post-national constellation, constellation in the first place for Europe and uh, for the background of the European Union and and the unification process of uh, of and within Europe. And I don't think that it can be applied so easily uh, to Israel. So it's not about questioning um, the nation state as such. It's not about uh, when we are against the national principle that we start with Israel. So this is, uh, I don't think that this is a Habermas point. but for instance, uh, yesterday we heard uh, talk about South Africa, <coughs> and they're using precisely this kind of universalistic, post-nationalist uh, discourse to demonize Israel. Yes, yes, I think this is a problem maybe in the concept of Habermas, because on the one side we see that it is, uh, this is a normative concept, that it is um, um, something which we should work towards. And on the other side, he uh, sometimes uh, represents it as already given. So this is a, a, a difficulty, uh, which is very, it's, it's difficult to, 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 to move within uh, this uh, quite ambivalent constellation, I would say. It's pretty weird to take the messianic for uh, already given. <laughs> <laughs> I have two more hands to you, and do you do you? Yeah. The question is that you're talk of the history of the left and anti-Semitism in Germany. In Germany. Was there any link between the growing left collaboration between the growing Turkish population and that of the left's anti-Israel rhetoric? Um, I don't know if I got your question correctly. What do you mean with cooperation with the Turkish? Okay. 
did the Turkish did the growing Turkish population contribute to the left's formation of anti-Semitic views? Um, no, I, I I mean because of the shifting demographics and Germany West. Germany, at least, is de facto a country of immigration. I didn't want to be, but many Turkish and uh, people came um, starting in the 60s. And um, of course, there was a shift, but I don't think it has contributed very much for a specific leftist form of anti-Zionist, anti-Semitism. Um, I think what, what we can um, see now is as form of Islamic anti-Semitism. And that can be contributed to the growing uh, Turkish and Arab um, population. But for the left as a movement, I don't think that the demographic um, shifts were relevant for the specific. I mean, you have this leftist ideology of anti-imperialism, of, um, uh, I, I would say, universalism, wrongly. Um, interpreted, but um, for all these ideological concepts, <coughs> for the concept of secondary anti-Semitism that was um, explained in the other talks, um, it doesn't make any difference whether there's a big or uh, small Turkish population. Mm -hmm. well, uh, okay, sorry. Um, I have so many questions, so <laughs> it's, it's actually for Karin and Bjorn more than anyone else. Um, we'll start with Habermas, why not? Generally, though, wouldn't you agree that when Habermas writes on the post-nationalist entity of Europe, I'm um, thinking of the Frankfurt Allgemeine Zeitung, the Inigo or Europa's article from a few years ago, it's usually in contraposition to the nation state most closely affiliated with Israel, that being the United States. So is this post-nationalist discourse, since it's seen as opposed to the U.S. model, could you then not see it as applied in opposition to the Israeli model? I, I may not be asking this the right way, but it, I think if you can see the essence of what I'm getting at. And then I'll get to the other question. Should I answer that again? Please. Okay. Um, Again, I, I don't know whether I, I got your, your question correctly, but um, I think that, um, as, I, as I stressed in, in my talk, um, Habermas, for Habermas, nationalism is an ethnic, ethnic nationalism in the first place. And I have the impression that nationalism in the USA is uh, coined somehow differently. So more in the direction of what Habermas understands under, with uh, constitutional patriotism. Yeah. So it's more about civility, it's more about citizenship. But still, citizenship in most European countries is uh, an ethnic uh, uh, category. Right. So, uh, so it's not so easy to divide uh, the, the civic form from the ethnic one. So, uh, yeah, I would agree with that with his earlier writings, but it seems as of late it's, it's trended more towards just identity. Mm -hmm. Yes, maybe we should. Oh, we should talk about yes. that. But, but here's a much, from my perspective, the much more que important question. This deals with the propaganda, uh, the mosquito propaganda. This is more of a suggestion, but I would suggest going back to 1946 and copies of Neues Deutschland and the use of American imagery as a mosquito. Uh, trade union papers, Berlin and Zeitung, when it was in uh, a local SEP party organ, same cartoons. So there may be languages there that would be more. Thomas Hauri has done this in his book on yes. anti Semitism and nationalism. And my question is for Ulrika, and uh, it's. Um, I'm wondering if we found any evidence of, of, of Degus's refinery um, connected to Fasa, and, um, and of course then its alleged sale of uh, centrifuges to Iran uh, recently. Um, the, the link between Fasa and Degus's. Degusa. Uh, Degusa. Yes. Yes. So to uh, when? Well, in, in the 50s, and then its subsequent growth, and, and um, no, 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 no. more more concentrating on the, yeah, maybe you can tell me more about that. Later. I tell you what I know, I don't know. That. No, I'm going to cross that. 
Okay, thank you everyone. I think uh, it's time to go for lunch. Many already left. Thank you. Parliament. So um, I think that's a pretty scandal. Um, statements like this are merely <coughs> the climax of a longer development. In 2006, another parliamentarian of the left party wanted to invite members of Hamas to a conference in Germany. Um, they couldn't enter because they were denied entrance visas to Germany. Many in the left party see Hamas as a legitimate, democratically elected government. They don't care at all about the ideological foundation and they ignore the virulent anti-Semitism. Another example, during the war in Lebanon in 2006, Christine Buchholz, today a member of the Bundestag, called Israel and the US warmongering nations, and she continued, I quote, it's a German quote, but uh, it's my translation, quote, on the other side of the conflict stand Hezbollah, the peace movement in Israel, and the international anti-war movement. And uh, that is the side on which I'm standing as well. End of quote. I mean, this is a leftist politician, a member of parliament, saying that she's on the side of Hezbollah. Um, that is, um, seems um, unbelievable, seems very strange, but I think it points to essential shifts um, in leftist ideology and politics. One key factor of the leftist hatred of Israel um, is anti-imperialism that is defined by the economist's view of the world. This is a simplistic notion of complex modern societies and it often or basically always implies the personification of social relations. That leads to conspiracy theories and often Jews are seen as those pulling the strings behind the scene. Israel as a Jewish state is seen as a spearhead of Western imperialism in the Middle East and as an artificial state. Though they often don't talk about Israel, the Zionist entity, all the stuff you know, put it in quotation marks, all that stuff. The historical roots of the opinion in the left party are multi-layered. The first layer are the after effects of communist ideology and the politics in the GDR towards Israel. And the second layer is the result of the history of the new left movement in Germany starting in the 1960s. But let me come to the first one. The GDR was not an anti-Semitic state. Also, it had several anti-Zionist campaigns um, using anti-Semitic stereotypes. The GDR considered itself an anti-fascist state that had elim eliminated the root of fascism by nationalizing the big industry and expropriating the reactionary R Russian landowners, so-called Junkers, in Germany. The hegemonic notion of fascism in the GDR originated in the orthodox communist view expressed by Georgi Dimitrov in the mid-30s. And he said, fascism in power is, quote, the open terrorist dictatorship of the most reactionary, most chauvinistic, and most imperialistic elements of finance capital, end of quote. If fascism is seen primarily as a type of di a capitalistic dictatorship, anti-Semitism as an ideology has to be neglected. It was not seen as the core of Nazi ideology, but as a means of distraction by the ruling class to divide the proletariat. Auschwitz and the destruction of European Jews um, were not perceived as a rupture of civilization, as Ben Wiener, my PhD advisor, put it. Therefore, the Jews were not remembered as a distinct group of victims in the communist states in Eastern Europe. Um, the still existent anti-Semitism after 1945 in a big part of the German population was never dealt with in the GDR. Because according to the ideology of orthodox communism, the socialist nations were seen as the winners of history. So anti-Semitism was abolished because socialism was, had been established. Um, besides the historical context of the Cold War, these ideological aspects play a major role in explaining the fierce um, or ferocious um, veracity of anti-Zionism and the permanent comparison of Israel and Nazi Germany in the GDR. That is much more than a political critique, namely a fierce form of anti-Semitic anti-Zionism. And this hatred against Israel, deriving from the orthodox communist ideology, can be found until today in a large part of the left party. This is the first historical route. The other um, threat of um, 
anti-Israel resentment in the left party can be located in the history of the new left um, in West Germany. And the initial pro-Israel view, and partially anti-Semitic, has regained the absolute predominance um, in the party. And the latest example is an incident during the Gaza Freedom Flotilla. And um, this happened after I um, sent my um, uh, paper to this conference or applied, and then the incident I will point out shortly uh, during the Gaza Freedom Flotilla happened. Because two current and one former member of the German Bundestag were on board of the Mavi Marmara, the ship that was boarded um, by the IDF, and all belonged to the left party. So three German parliamentarians were on board of the ship. Um, Norman Pech is a former a law professor at the University of Hamburg and former member of the German parliament, Annette Groth and Inge Wöger, two union activists. They were shortly arrested um, when the ship was stormed, but soon released. The question is what happened when they came back to Germany? Were they criticized for co cooperating with fascist organizations? Did they have to justify themselves for supporting radical Islamists who are re reactionary to the core, who don't care about human right, rights at all, not to mention women's rights? No, not at all. They didn't have to just justify anything. On the contrary, the leadership of the party said that it was proud of their mission. Um, and the only audible voice from this in the party criticizing her colleagues, Peter Pausch, is the vice president of the German, German parliament, she now faces a storm of criticism from within the party herself. <coughs> the three passengers of the Mavi Mamara call themselves now survivors of the Israeli massacre. Uh, they started a propaganda tour in different uh, German cities uh, to talk about the heroic story. And there was one discussion event um, in Hamburg when Norman Pech, the former member of parliament and former professor, um, when he said that the next Gaza Freedom Flotilla, which is already organized, and the youth group of the left party organizes and, uh, for the Gaza Freedom Flotilla, the next one. And Norman Page suggested that the next Gaza Freedom Flotilla should be accompanied by German maritime forces that control the Lebanese border. That demand would de facto, de facto amount to using German military against Israel. And I mean, this is said by a former member of the German Leipzig University. And um, academically, I work on um, leftist French Jewish intellectuals in the post-war period. But um, the topic of my talk today will be about the anti-Semitic anti-Zionism within the left party, the Partei Die Linke, which is the left um, in English. And this is more out of a political interest. I'm a kind of political activist. I still consider myself a leftist. and. I argue that um, I'm pro-Israel and anti-anti-Semitic because I'm a leftist. And that's a pretty marginal position um, within the left, as you can imagine. And um, I also try to, what Nova Gold pointed out as being an activist in the feminist movement and criticizing the feminist movement from within, that's what I was trying to do in the last years within the left movement, which is a very hard and not very encouraging um, job. Um, but first of all, let me uh, thank the organizers for inviting me and giving me the chance um, to speak at this outstanding, intellectually inspiring um, conference. Um, the left party, or I want to discuss the reasons uh, for the fierce hatred of Israel within the party, which, as I will argue, are twofold. One source can be discovered in the history of the communist GDR, and uh, the other one in the history of the Western German New Left. I will argue that the left is of special interest because it has developed specific for, a specific form of anti-Semitic anti-Zionism that has become significant in other segments of society today. Um, concerning the hatred against Israel, uh, the left sometimes seems to be the trendsetter for the whole society. I will point this out uh, later um, concerning a parliamentary decision um, by the German Bundestag. Um, the an analysis of the left thus deserves more than the marginal attention. But let me start to, start to talk a little bit about, about the left party because it's probably not very much known um, in the US. 
the left party plays an increasingly bigger role in the German political spectrum. It was founded in 2007 as a fusion of two other parties. So there are, um, were parties before it, but um, one of the parties being um, the former Eastern German Communist Party, the SED. Um, today, the left party is a conglomeration of different currents ranging from orthodox Stalinists to moderate reformers. But one thing is certain, the party has become an influential player in German politics and it has a strong influence on the European left in general. Just to give some numbers and, and make it clear, uh, the party gained 12% in the last national election in 2009, so it's the fourth biggest party in the German national parliament, the Bundestag. Um, it also has several members in the European Parliament and its most important player um, concerning parties in the uh, European left. It is represented in 13 out of 16 federal parliaments and it's part of a governing coalition in two federal states, one being the capital Berlin. So the left party is part of the governing coalition um, in Berlin. In the elections in the last two years, um, the party has grown up, up to 28% in the Eastern German state, states, which is the former GDR, and up to 20% in the Western states. These were just some numbers to make uh, the relevance clear of the left party um, within the German um, political spectrum. Um, as I mentioned, I consider myself part of an unorthodox left, and um, I was a founding member of a group called Bach Shalom, which is working group um, Shalom within the left party. We tried to criticize anti-Semitism, anti-Zionism, anti-Americanism um, within the party. And for some time, we got a lot of media attention. We forced people to deal with our position because the position were formulated from within. They were articulated within the party, so they couldn't be dismissed as some kind of lunatic pro-Israel leftist position. People had to deal with us. And they were really annoyed by it. And I, I gave many talks on these topics. I was yelled at to be a Zionist traitor, neocon warmongering, uh, right-wing lunatic, whatever. All the things, uh, not a gold point at all. Um, but we really managed to get the media attention. And for some time, I was carefully optimistic that it might be possible to influence a party discourse. But um, this has failed, unfortunately, for the time being. And the orthodox leftist position that is anti-imperialist, strongly anti-Israel, 